The Premier League 2021-2022 season is upon us. And this is part one. We will talk about the title contenders. We will talk about the Europa and Champions League spots. Of course, the top seven. The top seven, because we know Tottenham and Arsenal fans will get mad at us if we don't mention it. We have former England under-21 international, Aston Villa, West Ham, Bolton, and Wimbledon, Nigel, Rio Coker. He's going to be with us throughout it all as we discuss the favorites to win it all, top four, and so much more. Premier League part one, because part two comes on Thursday. Premier League part one, Kego Lasso, begins right now. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gigo Lasso. So excited. This is our Premier League preview part one. Numero uno parked on. And of course, I need to have the big guns today. And I have my good friend, former England under 21 international, Wimbledon, West Ham, Aston Villa, Bolton, Ipswich. He also played at Vancouver White Cups, Chivas, Montreal. His resume is insane, but he's a much better person as well. Nigel Rio Coker. Nigel, how are you, my friend? I'm good, thank you. Pleasure to be on air with you this morning. Absolutely, my friend. Absolutely. Uh, so good to have you. This is part one, everybody. First of all, Nigel, how's your summer been, my friend? How's my summer been? Yeah. It's, it's been very family oriented. Just been spending time with the kids, a uh, few different things going on, but just enjoy the simple life is the best way to put it this summer. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. If you don't know Nigel uh, by Adam, you should know that he's uh, he's, a, he's a man of s simple taste. He just likes it simple, take it easy, nice and chill. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to analysis, he's ready to go. And that's why he's here. So Nigel, listen, uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Obviously, as we introduced the very top of the show, this is part one, everybody, of our Premier League show. Part two will come out tomorrow again as well with Nigel. And part one is all about the big guns in the Premier League for 2021, 2022. We're talking about the title contenders. We're talking about who will make those Champions League spots, Europa League, and so forth. So really, we're giving it a top seven. Top seven. That's what we're focusing on. So before we begin, Nigel, I just wanted to see... How are you feeling as, as this Premier League season begins? Any Anything that's sparking off in your head that you think that you're looking forward to? I'm actually looking forward to all of it, if I'm honest. I'm, I'm very excited to see how this league goes. I think I'm more so very interested in Arsenal under Arteta to see how he does this year, because I think this will probably be a real judgment year for him. Um, but also you look at Manchester City, the Jack Grealish as an addition. I know that really hurts your heart, but... You know, Jack's gone to Man City, get over it. I know, and, Nigel, shut up. <laughs> and also, you know, their pursuit of Harry Kane. So I'm, I'm really excited. And, you know, you've got Liverpool players coming back as well with uh, Van Dijk and Gomez. So how they'll look this year, it really is going to be another exciting Premier League season. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, key players returning to the Premier League, I think, is a, is a major theme of, of this one. Um, by the way, everybody, thank you so much for being part of the Kego Lasso fam as we begin season two. Of course, Nigel Rio Coker here with us. Make sure that you rate and review the pod, by the way, wherever you're listening. It only takes a few minutes and, uh, you know, you can even keep listening while you do it. You don't even need to pay the tremendous fee that you paid for Greg Jack Grealish. You can just do it for free. Just rate and review. All right, Nigel, let's kick things off. All right. Listen. The title contenders. Obviously, uh, Man City enters this as the defending champion. Then you have interesting storylines, as you mentioned. Liverpool revamped again. Virgil van Dijk feeling good. Gomez, of course. And, you know, they already have a squad, you know, that, that that's always willing to fight, even though they lost Gigi Wijnaldum. I think there's still a lot of potential there. Who knows what they might bring in before the end of the transfer window as we tape this, of course. You know, it's still days to go. We have Chelsea as well, Romelu Lukaku, impending arrival. Um, you know, and you mentioned Arsenal, Arteta, can they improve? Leicester City, Leicester City is an improving one. Manchester United, you can't deny the good summer transfer business they've done uh, with Jadon Sancho, Rafael Varane. Let's focus first on the title contenders. When you're looking at this Premier League season 2021-2022, who are you looking at that you think can dethrone Manchester City? Can dethrone, I'd have to say, you'd have to put Liverpool in that mix. You'd also have to say Manchester United and Chelsea. I think they're the main three that can really challenge Manchester City this year. You look at the businesses that they've done, the players that they've brought in. You know, you look at Chelsea now, I think Lukaku, the impending transfer of Roman Lukaku, adds a complete different dynamic 
to their style of play, of what they can be capable of this year. If they can keep him fit for an entire season, it'll be a vital point for them this season, this Premier League. You look yeah. at Manchester United, the business they've done, you know, they've got Sancho in, they've always wanted to compete. And you have to say, again, this is going to be a very important season for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. There can't be no more time given to him. He's got the players that he wants in. He's getting the players that he wants in, so to speak. So this is going to be another season like Arteta at Arsenal, where Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is going to get a lot of judgment this season. And yeah. then you look at, obviously, you know, um, what was the other one? There's Chelsea. Well, we've got, as you mentioned, right? You were talking about City, Chelsea, Manchester United, Liverpool, and then, of course, there's Leicester City that, that, that were fighting hard late in the game, Tottenham and Arsenal. Anybody else or anybody including of that line that you that you like, that you seem, uh, you think they can fight? I do like Leicester City. I really do like Brendan Rodgers. I think he's a very underrated manager, but I just think for squad in the, the strength of their squad compared to the likes of Manchester United and Chelsea and um, Manchester City and Liverpool, it's still just not quite there. I just think that those squads there are just at another level compared to everyone else. I think Tottenham's going to be in a disarray, and I just don't feel Arsenal are going to be anywhere near up there. Yeah. Yeah, well, we will talk about Arsenal in a second as well. And as we mentioned, you know, if we're talking about title contenders. Obviously, we have to begin with the defending champion. Let's quickly talk about Manchester City for a second, all right? You talked about, obviously... Yes, uh, the man that I can't mention. I'm just going to say JG. That's his name. Or right, 100 million. Uh, the biggest transfer ever for a British player, of course. But it's not just about him. Now you have, obviously, a tremendous amount of talent. But, Nigel, you talked about Harry Kane and Tottenham. And, you know, that's uh, their first rival in the beginning of the season. Man City only have one number nine right now. Right? Gabriel Jesus. That, to me, is a major problem. All right? So we're looking at that. How are they going to do? Obviously, they have to bring somebody else in. Also, the, the pressures... The pressures of the Champions League as it, come, as it comes in through the season will be a major problem. Their first fixtures for Manchester City are Tottenham away, Norwich at home, Arsenal at home, and then Leicester away. Talk to me specifically about Pep Guardiola, Manchester City. He won the Premier League. The Champions League remains his treasure that he needs, right? So how can he do it? Does he have the squad right now to do that, to win the Champions League and retain the Premier League title? He does. You have to say that they're going to be very, they're, they're well prepared. I just think that with Pep Guardiola, he's not too bothered about having a traditional number nine. He's so used to playing with a false nine. I think that when he does add a traditional number nine, it does give them a different dynamic. You know, when you got Sergio Aguero, when he was playing, when he was fit and firing, he was fantastic for them. But again, he likes with he likes playing with this false nine. That's always been his style. And I think if they add Harry Kane to it, my main belief in that, I think, is Manchester City want the Champions League. That is what they're going for. They've won the Premier League title a few years now. They're not interested in that. The owners want the Champions League. That's where they're going to get that kind of worldwide recognition. They've never won it. And if you look on the other hand, on the, across the river, so to speak, you look at what Paris Saint-Germain are doing. They've brought in some... World Who, what have they done, Nigel? I, I don't know. I've, I've kept it quiet. What have they done? What have PSG done? I don't know what they've done, but I've heard they brought in a certain player called Messi. <laughs> I've heard they brought a certain player called Messi in and Sergio Ramos and Juan Alden. They've got a few players that have come in there, you know. But um, if you look at what they're doing, again, they're a club that's showing the intent and their intent is Champions League. That's yeah. what they're going to be judged on. And I'm sure Manchester City would have rather won the Champions League last year than the league title because that's what the owners want. They want to make that mark in not just European football, but when you win the Champions League, that's worldwide recognition. But I feel personally that Manchester City, Pep Guardiola is a very smart manager. You know, he plans far ahead. He already knows what he's going to do. And it's just going to be interesting to see how this pursuit of Harry Kane will play out and how that will work out. Yeah, well, that's the biggest thing, as you mentioned, right? Because as you show, I know it was just a community shield, but you did see like, okay, they need a, a prolific number nine. So let me ask you this, right? They need Harry Kane to win the Champions League. Is that what you're saying? And the Premier League? Can they do one or the other without him? I think it gives them an extra dimension. And definitely, like you said, with the players that have got around him and the chances that they will create, Harry Kane is a prolific striker. There's no taking that away from him. And I think with the indifferent time he's played under Jose Mourinho, he's added a different dynamic to his game, being able to drop off into that false nine role, link up play, making, um, you know, passes and assists a lot more as well, which works well for Manchester City. 
you know, because if he seems to get so worried about Harry Kane, he can change tactically by being able to drop off in the hole, allowing space for the likes of Mares, Sterling to make those runs in behind. But he's yeah. also a very prolific target number nine, which brings a complete different dynamic to them and the players he's got around him. You know, you expect him to score a lot of goals for Manchester yeah. City. Yeah, I just I I worry that they, they, they it needs to happen if they want to do that double because you know it's it's fine spending so much money on 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 the player I won't talk about but you know you need that number nine as well to support Gabriel Jesus. All right, let's move on here. You mentioned Liverpool to you is one of a main contender. Obviously, they won the Premier League before that one. That so, they had so many issues last season. You cannot deny the fact. Actually, I remember saying at the end of last season that. Jurgen Klopp achieving a Champions League spot was actually commendable because of just so many injuries and everything that happened to them. Now, as you said at the beginning, Virgil van Dijk is back. Gomez, of course, they're looking healthier, stronger. They're looking ready. Jurgen Klopp obviously is on a revenge mission. Are they your main contender to dethrone Manchester City? Because I have another one. I would have to say, yeah. I would have to say Liverpool are the main contender because they know what it's like. They've had a taste of, you know, Premier League triumph. And last year, there was a lot of things that happened that was out of their control. And they just had to patch it up the best way they can to just finish off the season. So now, like you just said, they're a bit more well-rested, but they've still got that taste in their mouth of being Premier League champions. And I know that's what they're going to want again. They're going to want that feeling again. And now with fans coming back, it's going to be even a lot more emotional and even more better for these players to achieve that, to actually get to celebrate with their fans because of how many years they've been about winning the Premier League title. I think they're definitely probably going to be the best contenders. And Jurgen Klopp has a history of like who likes to work with small squads. He yeah. doesn't like big squads. He doesn't like lots of players. He likes a small dynamic where you can control a lot of players and be in a lot more happy and healthy environment. And that you can see that a lot of Liverpool's players are all on the same page. And I'm sure now he's had time to get them together and players are coming back, that they're going to be even more so motivated. And with a manager like Jurgen Klopp, I'm sure it's not going to be hard for him to motivate his players. Yeah, no, really good point. And a few other things, by the way, our producer, Des Norris, uh, our new producer to the show, by the way, Des Norris, joining Lisa Roman, uh, added a few good notes here. See what I did to you, Des? I, I'm, I'm bringing you in the show already and giving you already some good things. But he mentioned also, you know, uh, the African uh, Cup of Nations will, will be a, a little bit of a hindrance for Liverpool as well, right? They have a few players that will represent in that. By the way, they're opening fixtures for Liverpool, Nigel. Norwich away, Burnley at home, Chelsea at home, leads away. Uh, they've been pretty quiet in the summer. Do you think they need anything specific? Obviously, we're now them leaving. Do they need something in the middle? Yeah, you, you do worry about that midfield area. That was a point when they were going through their struggles, where they really struggled, when they had to drop Henderson back into that centre-back role. That midfield area wasn't as dominant. But I think now, you know, you've, you've got the likes of Fabinho signing a long-term deal, Henderson there. And you've also got to give credit to Jurgen Klopp. He's not a manager that's just sitting there and, and being active or reactive, so to speak. He's very proactive and he's obviously a manager that trusts a lot in the youth system and he believes in young players and he gives them opportunities. And right now with the mix of players he has there, there's no better opportunity as a youngster coming through a club when you have such well-experienced senior players still at the club who can guide you, who've won Premier League titles, won Champions League medals, they're the best times to come in as a youngster into a team to really learn and embrace the winning culture and learn more about, you know, playing the game at that professional level. Yeah, I, I'm interested also to see about those uh, players like uh, Takumi Minamino and Alex Osley chamberlain I wonder what will happen with him. I think those kind of rotational players, how much they might add, but I still think they need a, a, another midfielder in there to help them out. All right, you mentioned Liverpool, Nigel. Uh, to me... The biggest contender to Manchester City is Chelsea. I think that what Thomas Tuchel did in about five months uh, last season and winning the Champions League, getting to an FA Cup final, getting the Champions League spot, you know, and the way that they played, defensively minded, et cetera, was, was pretty good. And now, Nigel Rio Carco, well, Romelo Lukaku returning to Chelsea as their main star. That just adds a whole other dimension. As we just after we were taping, I was on HQ saying how like it doesn't only help Chelsea for their teammates. Lukaku now helps Tuchel with multiple formation decisions. Now he can he doesn't have to do three four three. He can do four two 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 four three three. He's I mean how important is Lukaku's arrival to Chelsea? 
It's very important. I think that's what they were missing. You know, you had the, the, the likes of young Tammy Abraham coming through and the, the youngsters they had bringing through at the club, trying to carry that burden of playing for Chelsea and what it means. It was difficult. You know, Lukaku's a seasoned pro. But again, you've got to have this and bear this in mind. The Premier League is a lot different to playing in Serie A. It's a lot more competitive. Every player in the Premier League generally is strong, quicker. And you heard that Timo Werner also, I think, did an interview during the season last year and said he was just so used to being in Germany, being quicker than all these defenders and stronger. Yeah. That's why he was so successful. He said he didn't realise how competitive the Premier League is and how much more in better physical conditions Premier League players are. And the more so in the Premier League, players play like a team, as more as a team and a team formation. If one man gets beat, you have to get across. It's not that kind of way in the German League. It's kind of your man is your man and that's it. That's your responsibility. If he beats you, then the goal's your fault. You know, so there's a lot more team dynamic to it. I think Lukaku is going to be very vital to Chelsea, like you said. But again, the question I have for Chelsea for me is defensively. I still feel defensively they're not as solid as Liverpool. What if they bring Jules Conde, Nigel? Pardon? What if they bring Jules Conde, the centre back from Sevilla? If if they do, then yes, I think definitely then they've shored up, you know, and I think that's why exactly that they know that they're not still quite there defensively, and that's why there is an interest in him to bring him in. But if you look at the transformation of Van Dijk, what he did to Liverpool's back line, and obviously they do have other talented players, but just that presence, Thiago can do that certain element to that for Chelsea, but again. How long can he do it? Can he last the whole season? It's very demanding. Is he capable to play a whole season? And, you know, being a leader of that back line, I still feel that they're susceptible to concede goals in certain games. Yeah, no, it's a it's a fair argument. I think that once Lukaku arrives, if they get Kunde, they to me are undoubtedly the number one contender to try and dethrone. I just think that I, I believe it's not so much about their personnel, which is obviously amazing. I believe in Tuchel that much. I think he's that much of a good manager. And I think that when he has a preseason and a summer to take care of business, it's going to be really intriguing. Obviously, this is a US based podcast. So we got to talk about Christian Pulisic. He had a really good summer, uh, Nigel with, uh, you know, the Nations League, and then he went back. And, of course, you know, everything that's gone on, there's a great piece uh, via our James Bench where he talked to Christian Pulisic. He's doing a lot of work uh, towards the mental health uh, issues and stuff in in the game and out of the game. But Pulisic, uh, how do you see him fitting in? Because I I do wonder if Lukaku's uh, introduction now limits it because is it Chilwell and Reese James as fullbacks and then you make everything else more vertical. Like, h- how do you see his role this season? I just see he's going to be in a rotation role. I just don't think he's going to play every game. I don't think he's going to play week in, week out. You know, I think that he's going to be used when necessary, so to speak. And depending on tactically how the manager wants to set up against opponents, he'll be used. And that's just the reality of it. You know, Chelsea are going to be competing, competing on all fronts. I'm sure they're going to want to win the Champions League again. They're going to want to win the Premier League and they're probably going to want to win the FA Cup. You know, they want to do the treble. So it's a, it's very demanding, the modern game now. I think uh, Pulisic's a fantastic player, but yet he still has to kind of earn that right. You know, um, it, it's Chelsea. This is what comes with playing at big clubs. You know, very few players can really go in there and demand and command a starting place week in, week out without no questions asked. You know, he's a, he's a very good young player. He's uh, probably, for me, I would say he's the most talented American player that I've seen so far mm. of uh, many generations. You know, but he has to show that competitive edge now. There's a part where you get credit and applause for being seen as a you know very good, talented player. But then you have to go out there and carry that burden. You have to go and show, yeah, I am the man. You know, this is, yeah, this is me. I can carry this team. And that's, I think, the part of where Pulisic is at still at Chelsea, where he has to go out there and show and let people know why he is one of the highly rated players at Chelsea. No, absolutely correct. Uh, listen, to me, if Luk- Lukaku in, if Kunde comes in, now Chelsea have a really, really good squad. Only Man City racked up more points since uh, Thomas Tuchel was appointed, uh, by the way. Uh, it shows just how much of an influence Tuchel has done for Chelsea. By the way, Chelsea's uh, initial fixtures, Crystal Palace at home, away at Arsenal, away at Liverpool, and uh, at home uh, to the greatest club in the in the universe, Aston Villa. So we'll see what happens there. All right, let's finish with Manchester United in terms of the contenders here. Uh, we can talk Leicester City in a second, but actually, before I do that, Nigel, we were talking about Romelu Lukaku, 
who came from Inter Milan. You mentioned a little bit about Serie A. Guess what? Serie A is going to be on Paramount Plus. Paramount Plus, baby, your home for soccer. Stream every match of Serie A, Italy's top league, featuring some of the world's best clubs, including Juventus, Inter Milan, AC Milan, Roma, Napoli, and so many more. Plus, some of the world's biggest stars as Cristiano Ronaldo, Weston McKennie, Slatan Ibrahimovic, Olivia Giroud, the beautiful Olivia Giroud, and many more. <laughs> With live matches and heart-pounding CBS sports coverage, you don't want to miss. There's a lot of American influence, by the way, as the newly promoted Venezia have a lot of American talent, including Gianluca Busio, U.S.-owned Venezia, by the way. Serie A kicks off opening weekend, August 21st and 22nd, streaming exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. Nigel, you remember those days in the 90s, Serie A, right? I feel like that energy is coming back. Of course. I remember those days as a youngster watching... We used to call it on, on Channel 4 before yeah. cable. It was called Gazeta. James Richardson sitting on that table drinking his coffee. Drinking his coffee <laughs> when uh, Paul Ince went to Inter Milan. Ooh, the baby. Florentina, Gabriel Batistuta, Rui Costa, you know, Trezeguet, Zinedine Zidane. Oh, my Ram. Unbelievable. Those were the days. And you feel that it's coming back again now in Italy, especially with the Italians winning the European Championships. And you look at generally Italy is a nation you know the culture in football is changing now you know they're they're becoming a lot more modern they've always been a nation that's been very defensively minded they get one goal they sit down and defend and be a very hard team to beat all players are generally very technically gifted and the thing I like about Italian football is they can play every aspect of the game they can do the dark arts if needed but they can also play beautiful football if needed and they just know how to win you know to a certain degree you can say the Italian culture has always been built on gladiators when it comes to football, and that's what they take onto a football pitch. So you do feel excited about this Serie A season and what's to come. Yep, absolutely correct. And you can watch it all on Paramount Plus, uh, by the way, in those 90s days. My God, I feel like they're coming back. But anyway, this is the Premier League preview part one with Nigel Rio Coco. We're going to keep going here. We've talked about Man City. We've talked about Liverpool. We've talked about Chelsea. We've got to talk about Manchester United, Nigel. Manchester United, talk about the 90s. Man United ruled the 90s. And now, slowly but surely, they're trying to come back to that. I don't know if it'll ever be like Sir Alex Ferguson days. But Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, right, uh, has a new contract, obviously getting ready for a new season. It was a good summer for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, Nigel, I think. Jaden Sancho, Rafael Varane. Is it enough, Nigel? What do you make of uh, Manchester United? Well, it had to be a good summer for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer because he knows that he's under the spotlight again greatly this season. So he had to make the right additions and he felt that, you know, I think Sancho is a great addition for them. But again, it's where, I don't know, it's hard to see where he's going to fit in exactly. You know, you look at how well Lingard did at West Ham. Can Lingard recreate that same form for Manchester United this season? You know, and you've got still Paul Pogba there. It's it's very, very difficult how he's going to be able to keep all these players happy. But I'm sure he learned a lot from uh, Alex Ferguson under his time. I still just see Manchester United being short to really compete against the likes of the Chelsea and also the Manchester City and Liverpool. But one thing about Manchester United, there's a certain expectancy when you wear that shirt. You know, and that's something that I think that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has brought back to the club. I mean, that belief and the pride of wearing that shirt and competing to the highest level and you're expected to win every game. Um, it's going to be interesting. I, I really am going to say that I think it's good additions that he's made, but I still just don't feel Manchester United are at the same level of Manchester City, Chelsea and Liverpool. Do you think, Nigel, and I'm just trying to be a devil's advocate here for Manchester United fans, was it a mistake to keep Ole Gunnar Solskjaer? Do you think they could have gone for somebody bigger? Um, what, what do you think? Bigger isn't always best. I think that it's good that they gave him the time. Uh, I think that the, the biggest thing you've got to do when you give managers an opportunity is I think the players that you bring in, it's vital that you have someone there to bring in the right players. But if you bring in the right players, the players that can be very adaptive to different styles of football and different managers, you'll be fine. But if you bring in only certain type of managers to a manager that then you go and sack, it's going to be another period of time and process of rebuilding that team and getting in the right players again. So it's always vital that you bring in the right players, especially at clubs of that level. And I feel for Manchester United, they've brought in the right players. They've got a 
good experience of youth and youngsters coming through. So it will make it easier now for if another manager comes in, he already has a great core nucleus of players to work with. Yeah. Something I really like about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, well, I don't know if that's the word, but something that's in, interesting about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is that we've seen the best out of this newly modern Manchester United under him, and we've seen the worst under it. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like a yeah. Jekyll and Hyde situation. And now I feel that, I think Varane is 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 a huge addition. It's not talked about enough because he, he really will be, he's a World Cup champion coming from Real Madrid, right? Forget about will he fit in the Premier League. I think he's good enough. Obviously, he'll get ready for it. And now with Harry Maguire, I think that'll be key. Well, well, you, you're shaking yeah. your head a little bit. No, nah, because you have to. You do have to take that into consideration. I think that it's. Oh, no, you do. You do. Yeah. Football stars. Yes, he's won Champions League medals. Fantastic player. But the Premier League is a complete different kettle of fish, as they speak. You know, you speak to a lot of players that I played with who've come from different leagues. They know that the Premier League is the most hardest and competitive league. One hundred percent. I'm with you there. One hundred percent. So for me, you still have to have that in mind to say. First time in the Premier League, you've got to give him a bit of room to kind of settle in because it's not as easy as people think it is. No, it's definitely not. And I'm with you 100%. I think my bigger point was that, you know, this is not a player that's going to come in and feel overwhelmed by the grandiosity of it. I think he's going to be ready. And when you have a good supporting cast, I think it's going to help you. Make no mistake about it. I mean, come on now. Nigel, you know it. I grew up in England. To me, the Premier League is the golden goose. And when you enter this Premier League, you got to be ready for everything. You've played in it, and you know exactly what we're talking about. What, let me just focus a little bit more on the squad with Manchester United, because yeah. then I'm thinking about, you know, Anthony Martial. What's his summer going to be? What's his season going to be, right? Uh, you mentioned Paul Pogba. Mason Greenwood, will he even elevate himself a little bit more? You know, we talked about Liverpool and Chelsea. How realistic is it of the red side of Manchester to dethrone the blue side of Manchester? It's not that realistic, if I'm honest. I think that the problem, like you said, we've seen every side of Manchester United under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. And I think my biggest criticism of Manchester United was the inconsistency. And I think yeah. that's still going to be something that kind of creeps in there still while Ole Gunnar Solskjaer continues to build that squad. And a lot of that inconsistency generally, when you've got a core foundation of senior players who've come through that club and have that real winning mentality and a, a really driven and ambitious to continue to win and, you know, the winning culture, it makes it so easy to get rid of that inconsistency because there are no days off. But remember, you just mentioned, you know, Mason Greenwood, you've got some young players there. This generation is completely different from the older generation. So it's harder to kind of build that. It takes a while for them to really get embedded into that winning culture and wanting to win every single game, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the difficult thing there with Manchester United. I still see a sense of inconsistency while, you look at the demeanor of Pep Guardiola, he wants to win. He builds that winning mentality from training. And now he's got senior players at Manchester City who have played and won big things, you know, European competitions, and they want to win. So it's embedded. It's easier to be embedded in Manchester City and have that winning mentality cons consistently than I feel at Manchester United still. But again, it makes it easier if they do bring in a new manager. When you look at that bed of players, that they've got that pool of players, there isn't going to be much work needed in the transfer market because you do have an abundance of great talent there right now. Yeah, it's amazing that you just said about, you know, City getting consistently winning, United needing to do that when like in the 90s, it was the completely other way around. Yeah. All right, well, their opening games for Manchester United, by the way, are at home to Leeds, away at Southampton, away at Wolves, at home to Newcastle. Very doable opening fixtures for Manchester United. Obviously, Leeds you know, uh, intriguing, but, uh, you know, it's very, very doable. Is there any chance of silverware for Manchester United anywhere? Anywhere you see it? I think it's probably going to be one of the cup competitions. And I think that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer knows he needs to win something now. He really needs to win some kind of silverware or something and bring it back for Manchester United. So I think that this year they'll probably will take cup competitions like the FA Cup a bit more serious. And even with the FA Cup now, with fans coming back into the stadiums and stuff, I think that's going to be another extra element of, excitement and it's going to probably revamp that competition and bring it back alive again to yeah. its glory days yeah no i totally agree all right well let's keep going here we've talked about four all right and uh we said that we're going to be seven all right now listen 
I'm not going to do this, everybody. Okay, I'm not even going to mention Aston Villa. Okay, so we're just going to talk about, you know. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. <laughs> All right, I will probably. Are you kidding? Uh, well, let's move to the next one. I think Leicester City is the one that's worth talking about next. I, you know, honestly, you, you talked about Brendan Rodgers. I totally agree. Brendan well, Rodgers. I'll, I'll put Leicester and Aston Villa in the Ooh, same baby. Place. Yeah, I, I think I think Dean Smith's done a terrific job. You know, at first I was a bit skeptical when he did get the job, but from how he's handled that whole situation and you know with Jack Grealish and I felt at one point well. Two seasons, they were too heavily reliant on Jack Grealish. But he was yeah. a fantastic talent. You know, there's no denying the, the natural ability that the young lad possesses. And Dean Smith made it work. He made it work even though Jack was the main focal point. He still made him to be consistent and competitive. And I think the buys that they've done, I think Danny Ings is a fantastic steal. To get Danny Ings in there is a great, great buy by them. And um, they've done some great business this transfer window. They've really improved in the firepower element of things and um, I think that if they can get that real level of consistency I think Tyro Mings is growing to become a, a, a good leader as well so he's growing growing into that space right now and filling it in and um, Dean Smith is for me he is a good manager and I think bringing in I, I call him the OG the OG of Ashley Young back at the club now I think that's another fantastic cute signing there you know that's a player who deserves all these flowers because of what he's the career he's had and I've had the pleasure to sit in the dressing room with him. You know, he went to Manchester United. He's won titles there. He won the One Serie of my favorite Villa players ever. Yeah. You're just trying to get him on the show, but it's okay. Anyway, he's won Serie A titles. He's just <laughs> come back from that. That's why I said it. Um, I think he's a great influence in the dressing room because I know actually on a personal level and he is a winner. He is yeah. a character. And you need players like that, especially when you're trying to make that next step into Europe. Because there'll be yeah. times where he'll take control of that dressing room without the manager, Dean Smith, needing to say anything. And I think that definitely Aston Villa, will you'd have to stay there for me in the same boat as Leicester. Well, see, I love, listen, everybody, it was not me that said anything. I'm not even going to add anything because we're even going to talk about Villa probably a little bit more in part two, but I'm not, and more from a statistical, tactical perspective. You mentioned Danny Ings as well as Emiliano Wendy and Leon Bailey, et cetera. So we'll talk about Villa a little bit more in part two, but I didn't say anything. That was all Nigel. All right. It's so let's move on. I saw the Aston Villa program in the back there and the Aston Villa yeah, t-shirt. You know, I'm so. wearing my Punjabi <laughs> villain. I'm wearing my Punjabi villains uh, shirt as well. But <laughs> all right, let's talk about Leicester City. Brendan Rodgers, uh, definitely one of the best managers uh, in the Premier League. Extremely underrated. Won the FA Cup, the Community Shield, looking inspired. Um, they just missed out, man, won, on the Champions League. Europa League, obviously more of a realistic uh, component, but how how do you see this side, Nigel? Can they break in that top four? It's going to be tough. It really is going to be tough. And I think with Leicester, again, they're going to need a lot of luck to be able to do that because the squads that they're facing and, you know, the teams that they'll be going up against, uh, they've really heavily reinforced, you know, and, and you, you, like I said, you can see how serious Manchester City are about not just winning the Premier League, but also wanting to win the Champions League. Manchester United want to win the, the Premier League again and probably want to win the Champions League as well. All those teams we spoke about earlier are very competitive. And, you know, Leicester obviously doing very well what they can, but it's they're going to need an element of luck to break into that top four. And it's it's very hard to see them breaking into that top four. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping Kalenichi Iniacho keeps on building on that confidence. Obviously, Jamie Vardy's career is, you know, looking I don't want to say downward, but obviously age and time always ends up uh, introducing itself to a player. But I'm thinking more when it comes to Leicester City, Nigel, about their defensive side of things. Because Fofana and Evans remain injured, right? Uh, Kaglar Choyonchu uh, is really the only available center back right now. Who who, who partners with him? Uh, we do have Ryan Bertrand that comes in there. Bukabari Sumane is really good. Dhaka as well. That's a big one. Dhaka coming in from the Bundesliga. But defensively is where I worry. Yeah, exactly. You'd have to be worried of them defensively. You need to get off to a good start. And you know how competitive we've already said about how the Premier League is so super competitive. But one of the biggest things now you need in the Premier League is a solid defence. And we've seen not just the solid back four, but how important having a stable and world-class goalkeeper is now to winning Premier League titles. And that's not me taking any shot at all at Schmeichel. I think Schmeichel's a fantastic goalkeeper. 
um, Casper. He's a real good goalkeeper, but it's not just the back four. You know, the, def- the, the, the goalkeeper has to be a part of that unit. And you do worry defensively how they're going to be this year with the injuries, especially in, in pre-season that they've suffered already. So it will be a, it will be a heavy ask for, for Leicester to finish in the top four. Yeah, in the Community Shield, by the way, their uh, Ghanaian uh, multi-versatile man, Daniel Amarte, partnered up in, as a centre-back as well. So that that's something to look out for as well. But as you mentioned, it, it's going to be very difficult because at the end of the day, you can be as good as you want, but this isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. It's a and, marathon. Depending, exactly. and the and health of your you, squad is key. Yeah, go ahead. It's key. And then when you're doing players in versatile roles and stuff like that, it's different when you know they can do one or two games. But then when you're playing against top opposition, the likes of Harry Kane coming against you, his movement, his football intelligence, it's different when you're not conditioned to being a natural centre-back week in, week out. Yeah, no, absolutely right. They're opening fixtures, by the way. Wolves at home, West Ham away, Norwich away, Man City at home. And Leicester City already have the community shield and that will build some confidence, but intriguing to see how the Foxes once again do. All right, let's move on. You mentioned at the top of the show, Nigel, you're intrigued to see how Arsenal do. Under Mikel Arteta. Mikel Arteta, uh, a student of Pep Guardiola, a former Arsenal captain as well. Um, how do you see them, especially, you know, with fans coming back? I'll just give you some players that have come in. Ben White is a big addition. He's a very, very good player. Uh, Nuno Tavares, uh, Albert Sami Lokonga. Uh, you know, Ben White, 50 million though. <laughs> but a lot, lot of pressure to, to keep that hold. How do you see Arsenal, my friend? I see Arsenal the same Arsenal as we saw last year. I just see inconsistency. <laughs> I, I just don't see... Sorry, James great, Bench. Great. I don't see great pro- progression. I really don't. I think that this year, Arteta is definitely going to be under the microscope. And I just feel Arsenal's problem for me for many, many years. And speaking to some of the players that... The legends of Arsenal at the time when they were still there before they moved on. It's just been the recruiting. The recruiting has just been terrible for so many years. And... It's just, I think they've gone away, so far away from what made them Arsenal. From what, when Arsene Wenger took over and how he was, I think they've gone so far away from that. And they're more worried about, obviously, financial gain in the boardroom than they are about actually competing to win Premier League titles and, and Champions League titles. And I just don't see a tremendous amount of improvement for me in Arsenal. I just don't feel collectively they're there together as a team. You know, I think there's a bit too many egos as individuals for me. And um, to a certain degree, I actually do feel Arsenal players are a bit pampered. I think they're too overly pampered. And that's why I just don't see great progression. Yeah, no, I mean, listen, all valid points. It's just a friendly, but the one on a preseason game, but the one against Tottenham a few days ago really didn't show much. And it's kind of uh, it's kind of a little worrying because you got Lacazette up top and then they had like three line with Obama Young, uh, Smith Rowe and Pepe. But, you know, there's no Odegaard right now, right? Ceballos. That midfield worries me. It worries me a lot because the Shaka that plays internationally is not the Shaka that plays for Arsenal. Ah, Saka and Smith Rowe for me are the two key players for Arsenal this year. And that's, mm. that's worrying when you've got two young players who've just come out of the academy, still learning their trade, um, played a lot of football already. They're the two main shining beacon for Arsenal. So that, that's yeah. the worry inside. You know, yeah. I think Partey is a great player, but he just can't stay fit. You know, you need to get, he needs to get a whole season out of him. And again, that goes to show the difference of how it's like playing in La Liga to play in the Premier League. He just thinks he's coming. He hasn't been able to stay fit. He's taking tackles and I'm sure he's not used to that. And that's taken in mind, that. Nigel, and that's taken, sorry to interrupt, that's taken in mind the fact that he came from Atletico Madrid. Atletico well. Madrid, exactly. A manager that plays no games and pulls no punches. Like, yeah. uh, he would have been very competitive training week in, week out. But he's in there. I, I just think for me, Arsenal, again, I don't see great progression. I still feel Arsenal just some years and years behind it until they get the right manager. Funny that you just said that because I still believe that the manager they need to get in there and give him time is Diego Simeone. I think he's the one guy that can come into that club and put them right if they mm. give him time because well, they need those type of players back at Arsenal. Well, that answers your question about pampered players and that would totally get out the way if Diego Simeone came in. Uh, I love that idea, that philosophy. Uh, but Arteta, it is. Do you think a full Emirates Stadium is going to be a blessing or a curse for them? It's going to be a curse. Arsenal fans are 
you know, private school educated, uh, very pampered. <laughs> Prawn, prawn, prawn sandwich eating. So I love eat Nigeria cocoa so much. Gonna, listen, play there, I've played it to see. There. There's a lot of private school educated Arsenal fans there, and you know. Listen, you're preachy to the crowd. I don't want to say anything. I don't want to get in trouble. Like, but yes, like to get their shirt dirty. But um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I think it's going to be a lot more pressure because oh the, the Arsenal fans are going to be very demanding because. They can see the additions and the progression that Manchester City, Manchester United are making. And for Arsenal, it's, you know, they're, they're not going to attract top class players of that level. They don't have European football. They're not the Arsenal of old anymore. And they know they need to work to get back to that level. But come Arsenal play, and if Arsenal played the likes of whether it's Leeds or, you know, Aston Villa and they're 2 0 down at home, those Arsenal fans are not going to be roaring and encouraging them. You know, they're still living in the past of the Henri's, the Vieira's, the Burkamp's. So they've got to understand that they're not in that demographic or zone or that generation anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Well, their opening fixture is Brentford away, home to Chelsea, then Man City, then Norwich. And that's Arsenal. All right, let's talk about... Chelsea, Chelsea, Man City. <laughs> yeah. So it's... early on in the season. I okay. know. It's like one way you want to get it over and done with, but the other way, there's already six points that you can lose straight away uh, off the bat, which is... Uh, not a good thing. All right, let's stay in North London, though. But let's talk about Tottenham for a second. A new manager, Nuno Spirito Santo, a very good manager. Very intrigued to see how this Tottenham will look under him. Um, what do you make, first of all, of that relationship, Nuno and Spurs? I'm intrigued as well. I think he's a great manager. I don't know if the Tottenham job would have been the right job for him to take. And for me, I just didn't like how Tottenham went about the pursuing of a manager because there were so many different managers linked to it. And it's kind of how they ended up with Nuno in yeah. the end of that, because he's a highly rated manager, in my opinion, but he doesn't seem like he was first choice. And he's going again to a difficult oh, no, environment. He definitely where... wasn't first choice. Yeah, exactly. So he's a manager that's going into a difficult situation, if you ask me there. You know, the Tottenham fans, again, very demanding and uh, very competitive. You know, they want to be up there again, but I just don't think Tottenham are at that, that level anymore. You know, they've really kind of uh, decelerated down uh, for the past couple of years. Uh, difficult, you know, Deli Ali is a, a, a big player for them who hasn't really performed in the past year. We can be interested to see. It's really difficult to call any kind of judgment on Tottenham. I think it's kind of, we have to let it unra unravel as it, they, they go on. Yeah, well, do you think the saga of Harry Kane uh, is polluting much of uh, their plans? I don't think it's helpful. I think uh, for manager Nuno Santos, he wants his players to know who his players are going to be, whether they're going to be there or not. But the way um, Harry Kane is actually conducting himself right now, you can clearly see he wants to leave Tottenham. You know, he doesn't want to be at that club no more. And I think for me, he's been a fantastic servant at the club. You know, let him go, let him move on to something else. It's not his fault that the hierarchy at Tottenham have made bad decisions in managers that they've hired and, you know, very small decisions. And it's just that fine line. It's that fine line of winning Premier League titles and winning cups that is in the Premier League. You know, the, the simple, small things that people like, regular people might not see could be such a big difference into winning things. Yeah, no, absolutely right. And the thing is, I, I wonder, you know, you meant you were talking about JG and Villa and the, and the sort of uh, focus on him. It's kind of similar maybe sometimes with Harry Kane. Perhaps not so much with Tottenham because Heung-Min Son does so much for this team as well. But maybe letting go of him might be a blessing in disguise depending on how well you use those funds. I mean, you never know. I mean, he's, and also he's no spring chicken. He's not 24, 25 Harry Kane. Like, so what, what, what could you maybe get out of it if you're looking to rebuild, right? I think, well, let's be real. Tottenham have always been a very business minded club. And I, I don't understand why this one's becoming such a hard thing for them to do and very difficult. You know, they've always been a selling club. They've sold so many players from my playing time and players that you'd be very surprised that they were selling at that point, but they did. But like you said, if they use the funds well, then they can get some top players in. But again, it's that scouting network. How good is your scouting network to get maybe two or three young players coming in who are some of the best pro prospects in the world and giving them an opportunity because you never know. And that's the thing sometimes with football. Unless certain players are given an opportunity, you'll never know how well they can do or how well they can progress in the Premier League. You know, at the moment, currently, I've covered some games in Latin America, the Copa Libertadores, 
there's an abundance of young talent coming through. And yep. Juventus signed one of the best young players for me that I've seen in a long time in Carl Giorgi from um, Santos. And he is yep. a fantastic talent. And again, these are players that Premier League clubs could probably have access to to get, but it's whether their scouting networks are going that far. Yeah, well, with Brexit, I think there is more of a focus on South America, but time will tell if they keep going and going and going. We know that Manchester City is doing it. By the way, I don't want to get any Tottenham fan mad. We know Harry Kane signed a new six-year deal only last month. Uh, but What's you a know, contract we, worth these days in the Premier League? Come on, yeah, what's enough, Well, nothing, really. I mean, look at Jack Grealish. Uh, oh, I, I did say his name. My bad. That's the only time I'm going to say it. Uh, but all right, let's, uh, let's just keep focusing here on Tottenham to wrap everything up here. They're opening fixtures. We said it. Man City at home, away at Wolves, Watford at home, Crystal Palace away. Uh, an interesting opening uh, run of fixtures there, Nigel. Very interesting. I think you'd probably expect uh, six points on that opening run of fixtures there. It's going to be a very emotional return for him to Wolves. Uh, Manchester City is not the way you'd want to start the Premier League, especially with the situation right now with Harry Kane. And that's going to be interesting to see whether Harry Kane plays. I think that's another scenario there. Mm. You know, So there's going to be a lot of media attention on the first game in the Premier League. And if you lose to Manchester City, it's not going to be Exactly a great way to start your new um, period as a Tottenham manager. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, well, everybody. Well, we're nearly finishing up of part one. By the way, Nigel coming back for part two uh, on Thursday, where we'll talk about the best of the rest and all the intriguing storylines. But before we leave, Nigel, all right, let's do this quick fire round here. We begin with the top four predictions. Give me your top four Initial gut, I'm sure it will change slightly as the weeks go along, but your top four, what do you have? I will go just in not just the general top four or in order of top four. Give me your order, my friend. Uh, I'm being mean today. Give me your order. Well, you you did make you did I'm gonna go Liverpool, Chelsea, Manchester City. Wow. So Liverpool's retaining that title from two seasons ago. And then Chelsea, I, I did convince you with Lukaku and, and Tuchel, I guess. Uh, I forgot about that. Yes, you did. But <laughs> I will change Manchester City if they do get Harry Kane. Okay, fair enough. But they wouldn't, but you They're still don't see that. The whole dynamic. To the point that they would win it again? If they, Yeah, if they get Harry Kane, then it's to the point that they don't win it again. All right, you gave me three there. Who's your fourth coming in there? Manchester United? Manchester United, sorry. I forgot Man U. <laughs> we always do. It's all right. Uh, <laughs> all right, so that's your top four. All right, give me your top uh, your top goal scorer. Who do you think is going to be your golden boot winner? Plenty of ch chances, of course. Mohamed Salah, of course. Harry Kane, no matter where he plays, of course. This is you know. I'll, give you, I'll just give you four names. You're going to have to say Lukaku is going to be in there. Yeah. Harry Kane. Yeah. Salah. And... I won't rule out Danny Ings in there. Yeah! I won't rule out Danny Ings in there. I, I, I like Danny Ings. I think he's, he's a very, very good player, Danny Ings. I like him. The wind's beneath my Ings. Absolutely right. Uh, well done. Well, Romelu Lukaku has to remain a cover. <laughs> it used to be wind. Oh, gosh. Oh. All oh, right, listen. Geez. Nigel, I know you loved it. Last question, Nigel. Um, player of the season, who do you think? Player of the season. Mm, it, it's, that one's always such a difficult one. It really is. It's, it's... <sighs> By the way, as you it's think that, it. our producer, Des, was like, no Cavani for top goal scorer? Uh, no, no Cavani this year. No, Des, it's, move on. Come on now. Before you come in, uh, no, no. He's injury um, prone too, man. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't even think he's starting this week. Yeah. Player of the season is really a difficult one because I, I think now, finally, especially in England, growing up in England, it's not just about goal scorers. It's other players who can have such a big influence. You know, well, look at, look at last season, right? With Ruben Diaz, right? Ruben Diaz, exactly. And if, if Van Dyke comes back and beats the Van Dyke of old to command that Liverpool and push them into maybe nearly winning the Premier League title back again. He's he's a he's a contender for it, you know. I'm, yeah. I'm sure Jack Jack Grealish is going to be a contender somewhere along the line. You know, he's heavily a lot of heavy expectations on his shoulder right now with that price tag. Yeah, um, Kevin De Bruyne, you can always say he's always going to be in the running. 
and uh, Lukaku at Chelsea. Yeah, that's who I'm thinking about. Uh, I know it's very difficult to do that once you return again to a new league. I know that you've played it before, but it's been a while since then. But he's definitely in a conversation. I wonder, because we're talking so much about the Jurgen Klopp redemption, if Mohamed Salah is really on a mission this year um, and he really wants to prove something if he stays fit. But there's so many arguments. Kevin De Bruyne, of course, you mentioned JG. Uh, th there's a lot. Uh, but with a defender winning it last season, like you said, it's not just about scoring goals. It can come from anywhere. Um, it, can, it can come from anywhere. And, and it's about also just giving other players, like how we grew up watching football. Yeah. It wasn't always about stats and he's got these goals and these assists. We judge football on the player that can do something with a ball that other players couldn't, like the uniqueness of real individual talent. You're talking about the likes of Ronaldinho, Zinedine Zidane and all those stuff. But then you can also have very influential players, top players who are defenders. Like you said, the likes of Diaz, Van Dijk. And it's about time these type of players get a lot more recognition than just strikers and goal scorers because different players play different parts into making football such a unique game that it is. It's not just about the quarterback gets all the glory. Well there said. Go, see, I brought some American pun into that. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I mean, NFL, who's your team, by the way, in the NFL? You like anybody? Um, sadly, I'm a Dolphins fan. So I'm of, in Florida. of course, because you know you're in Miami, right? That's uh, right. Yeah, I'm a Dolphins fan. Yeah. Hey, yeah. we've got a good young team, but we don't yeah. know if two, we don't know if two was the guy yet. <laughs> we don't know yet. They're very young, but we they're they are talented. Yet. Well, listen, I'm just excited for Saquon Barkley to come out for the Giants. But anyway, enough of that. Premier League Part One is over. Nigel Rio Coker will return for part two. But Nigel, any final words before we say goodbye? Any final thoughts that we haven't talked when we specifically think about the top side of this table? Mm, not really. I just think that we're, we're going to be in for a treat. I think whether you're fans, whatever team you support, or whether you're a neutral, just love beautiful football. I think this Premier League season, you're going to be in for a treat. And I think one of the big things is all we've Lionel Messi going to Paris Saint-Germain has taken that kind of glow and aura of La Liga away. Because now, without being disrespectful, there isn't great world superstars that people are going to run to La Liga. And I think that's going to also entice probably a lot more of the superstars in the Premier League to want to stay in the Premier League or maybe make that change maybe to, to Italy, probably, or maybe even France. But yeah. the Premier League has definitely got an abundance of top quality superstars from around the world. No, absolutely correct. And there'll be more chat of the Premier League in part two. And we'll talk as well as well. There's a lot of new rules as well as the new league, new season begins. Nigel, thank you so much, my friend. Uh, we will see you very soon. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I want to thank Nigel Rio Coco for joining us today on Premier League Part 1. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Kego Lasso Pod. We are also on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Kego Lasso. We are on Spotify, Stitcher, CBS Sports, and your CBS Sports app. Have a great, great rest of your day and stay tuned with us because we have much more Premier League and even more weekend preview, recaps, and much more. Have a great day.